chapter. And today celebrates the exciting research conducted by master's students. Developed by the University of Queensland, the exercise cultivates students' academic presentation and research communication skills. The competition supports their capacity to effectively explain their research and its significance in three minutes only, in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. We know this was previously done by the University of the Free State, and in April, we received an invitation to also form part of this great initiative. This was the th first 3MT event. This is the first 3MT event at the Northwest University, and we hope to definitely do this more often. Now, we'll have a quick word from a professor who is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education at the Northwest University. He is an Associate Professor, and before his appointment as Dean, worked in the Department of Education, education Management and Leadership within the faculty. He also headed the Center for Education Leadership Development and Support. He also actively participates in professional bodies involved with education leadership and represents the Northwest University in many departmental committees. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Prof. Lloyd Conley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Louis. I wish I had your vote in speaking to people, but it's really a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here this morning, colleagues. And it's, I think it's such an uh, appropriate way to start off this Heritage Weekend, where we pay a respect to our students who have really put in a lot of effort and work to achieve what they have achieved in the last couple of years. You know, uh, it's not easy, but it's worth it in the end of the day when you reach your ultimate goal. Uh, giving recognition to, to people who have achieved is a thing that really happens all over the world. I was fortunate enough to have been to many occasions where recognition was given. And I think one of my highlights in my life was when uh, Castle Semenya, uh, won the, the, the gold at the Rio Olympics, and I was fortunate to be there. I don't think that the Olympics, uh, the ra race was the most important thing, but I think when they hoisted the flag for South Africa and Casta stood proud and the recognition was given to Casta, it made me realize it's worth being a South African with all the challenges that we have, with all the uh, difficulty that we have, South Africa, we love you. So this morning, it is really a privilege and a pleasure for me to welcome all our students, our Northwest University master's student finalists to this three minute uh, master's uh, presentation. I recall as a practicing teacher or when I studied my, my, my teaching degree, we were given one minute to do a full lesson. And I want to say to you, it might sound easy, it's not that easy because a minute goes in the flash. So the three minute thesis competition or 3MT is an annual competition held in 200 universities around the world. Maybe I should just get my, my, my side note in. Just to say that, remember, we are the safest university on, in, in South Africa, and it has just been proven. And more so, our students think uh, that we are one of the better universities. We are equally with UJ at the top. So being part of this 200 universities around the world uh, in this annual competition, it is open to PhD and master's students and challenges participation, participants sorry, to present their research in just 180 seconds, in a way that is understood by an audience with no background in the research. What a daunting task. The three minute thesis competition originates from the University of Queensland, Australia, and the UFS Postgraduate School was the first university to bring the three minute thesis competition to Africa. This year, is the first year that the Northwest University will host the competition of the PhD and master's students. So you are doing groundbreaking work this morning. The competition aims to help participants 
develop presentation, research, and academic communication skills and support the development of research students and the ability to effectively explain their work in a very succinct way. Today, we celebrate our first NWU 3MT competition, where the faculty winners will compete in the final master's competition. Of our 34 master's students who have entered the competition, 20 participated in the faculty competition in August. 15 participants will compete today for the winner, runner-up, and second runner-up prize money. It is interesting to see that the winner will be receiving 12,000 Rand, first runner-up 10,000 Rand, and second runner-up 8,000 Rand. It's also interesting to look at the statistics because all faculties are involved in this morning's event. Economic and Management Sciences has a total of six students. Education two, Engineering five, Health Sciences six, Humanities seven, Law one, and Natural Sciences. Uh, seven. So the challenge is that you present yourself in the way that you can only present yourself, that you can do best. The limit is 180 seconds. And I want to wish you well. I want to say to you, we hope that when you present your research, it's not just to win but it's also to build a legacy and to contribute to the heritage of our country. Everything of the best to each one of you and may the best man win. As we say at the North West University, it all starts here. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Lloyd Conley. What a word of welcome from the man himself. Now, uh, one thing that Prof didn't mention is that uh, the winning prize, let's just quickly name this. Second runner-up receiving 8,000 Rand today. First runner-up, 10,000 Rand. And the winner walks home with 12,000 Rand. That is really amazing. Now, over to the people that will decide who the winners are of this amazing competition, 3MT today. So uh, usually when we do uh, panels like this, it's in a big hall, but because of COVID, we're sitting all at home today. So I think just where you are sitting, just give a virtual uh, round of applause as I name these people. Our judges for today, let me welcome our first judge, Prof. Krizal Els from the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. Next up, Prof. Zandri Dickerson from the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. Dr. Suki Fansel from the Faculty of Education. Dr. Shanta Naidu from the Faculty of Education. From the Faculty of Humanities, Prof. Elise van Eden. Also from the Faculty of Humanities, Prof. Susan Kutsia van Roy. Next up, we have Dr. Zambili Mekize from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Prof. Ola Dapu Aremu from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Next up, we have Dr. Martinique Sparks from the Faculty of Health Sciences. And finally, from the Faculty of Health Sciences, Prof. Lesetja Lechwabe. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to our amazing judges. Now, they will be scoring you on a couple of things. So I just need to remind you of the competition rules this morning. A single static PowerPoint slide is permitted. No additional electronic media may be used. No additional props and presentations are limited to three minutes maximum and competitors exceeding three minutes are disqualified. Presents, presentations are to be spoken word and presentations are to commence from the stage, our platform this morning. Presentations are also considered to have commenced when a presenter starts their presentation through movement or speech. And the decision of the adjudicating panel is final. They'll be scoring you on a couple of things. Firstly, did the presentation provide an understanding of the background and significance to the research question being addressed while explaining terminology and avoiding jargon? Did the presentation clearly describe the impact and or results of the research, including conclusions and outcomes? 
Did the presentation follow a clear and logical sequence? Was the thesis topic, research significance, results, impact, and outcomes communicated in language appropriate to a non-specialist audience? I think that's a very important one. And did the presenters spend adequate time on each element of the presentation? Or did they elaborate for too long on one aspect or was the presentation rushed? rushed? And then uh, also finally, in terms of the engagement and communication, did the uh, uh, oration make the audience want to know more? Uh, was the presenter careful not to trivialize or generalize their research? Did the presenter convey enthusiasm for their research? Did the presenter capture and maintain the audience attention? Did the speaker have sufficient stage presence, eye contact and vocal range and mainly a steady pace and have a confident stance? And did the PowerPoint slide enhance the presentation? Was it clear, legible, and concise? Now, there it is. The judges are ready. I can see our presenters are ready. And uh, we can't wait to see what they have in store for us today in this 3MT. Now we go on to our presenters. The first one, maybe it's a difficult task to be first today, but let's hope she surprises us all and I welcome Miss Lisa Marie de Lange with her title, Anti-Corruption Systems in South Africa Towards an Effective Model. Guptas, VBS Bank and Busasa. All of these has become household names in South Africa linked to a series of corruption transactions. And that is just the tip of the corruption iceberg. Corruption happens when there is an abuse of public resources for personal gain. And it can take on many forms, from paying a bribe to the traffic police or to the stage where a small number of high-level politicians or business people conspire to influence a whole country's decision-making process for their own benefit, also known as state capture. But what do the numbers say? What is the size of this iceberg? State capture is estimated at one 0.5 trillion rand. Now you're asking, what does this to do with me? Well, corruption affects all of us. Load shedding, portals, poor infrastructure, poor service delivery. Corruption was involved in all of these instances. And what is our government doing about this iceberg? 20. That is the number of anti-corruption agencies established in South Africa. South Africa is using a multi-agency approach to combat corruption. That is a combination between already existing government agencies and corruption busting units to fight corruption. However, despite having 20 agencies, our anti-corruption model is not effective. Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. South Africa adopted the multi-agency approach in 2001. And although there is no significant improvement, we keep on using this model, doing the same thing over and over again. Thus, we are in dire need of finding the missing puzzle piece to an effective anti-corruption model. My research explores four different anti-corruption models used abroad to determine a proposed strategy. It also analyzed 10 of South Africa's most important anti-corruption units to determine the weaknesses in the system. The need for a dedicated, centralized, single agency unit became evident. A unit that functions independently from any other government agency. And instead of having a lack of skills and resources in almost every government agency, those skills should be pulled into the centralized unit to conduct effective investigations. I am confident that the missing puzzle piece is a single agency with a primary mandate of fighting corruption. Our vision for 2030 is a country with a zero tolerance for corruption, but if there's no intervention soon, this vision will never become a reality. So let's put in that missing puzzle piece. Let's fight corruption from a new perspective, a single agency perspective. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Lisa Marie, that was, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I think what a start to the day. And thank you to you, Lisa Marie de Lange, for that powerful message. Um, I think it's something that's really relevant to the times that we are in now. 
So well done and congratulations on a great start to the day. Um, I really hope that is maybe like the level that you've set now for everyone else. And if we can just take it from there, grow from there, we're going to have a fantastic day with this three-minute thesis. So next up, listen to this title. It's a long one. I hope you're ready for this one, judges. Exploring and evaluating a strength-based skills training program for unemployed graduates in the South African labor market. There you have it. And the presenter taking on this tough topic, Miss Matlashwane Matabane. I'm a graduate. And my strengths are communication, collaboration, and compromise. What comes to mind when the word graduate is mentioned? Perhaps an individual with a tertiary degree or someone with a bright future ahead of them. Unfortunately, the sad reality in South Africa is that graduates are unemployed. According to Stats SA, 2019 revealed a 31% unemployment rate among graduates. What can also be mentioned is that South Africa is a third world country with a shaky economy and unemployment rates are still increasing during this current period of COVID-19. Secondly, a large number of graduates are still being produced in the higher learning institutions. So a question to consider as South Africans is how will a labor market so overwhelmed with graduate unemployment be better able to prepare for employer needs? The answer is interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills involve interaction or relationships within the workplace. Every human being has a unique set of skills. By developing interpersonal skills, graduates increase their likelihood of employment. Some examples of interpersonal skills are communication, complex problem solving, critical thinking, leadership, teamwork, among other skills. Given the complexity of the 21st century workplace, graduates require investment through the development of strength-based programs. For graduates to be self-sufficient in their skills, they must make sense of their strengths and natural talents. By identifying their talents, building their talents into strengths, being consistent in the activity, graduates can reach a semi-perfect performance. In my research, a strength-based training program will be evaluated and explored for the unemployed graduates in the South African labor market. This strength-based approach will be used as a mimic of the general positive psychology model as to identify individual strengths. This includes four human behaviors, personal motivation, interpersonal skills, self-presentation skills, and learning styles. Finally, this research will be used as a guideline to assist graduates to develop their strengths in the new world of work. Hello. Thank you. That was Matla Shwane. Well done. That was a, an amazing presentation once again. You guys are really setting the bar high today. And um, remember this, this is the final. So uh, just a reminder, we had 34 master students enter the 3MT competition and 20 compete in the Northridge University semi-final faculty competition. 15 master students will compete today in the final Northridge University 3MT competition for the big prize money. Thank you once again to Ms. Matlashwane Matabane with that very, very tough topic, but uh, what a presentation to take us through that. Now, next up, we have Miss Tandekile Nontubeko Lamini. And uh, listen to this one. Factors influencing energy intensity in the manufacturing industry 
in South Africa. I can't wait to hear this one because I think, uh, again, what a relevant topic to the times. Let's now welcome Miss Tandikile Nontebeko Dlamini. We'll just give a moment there for Tanikile to come uh, onto the screen. Tanikile, if you can hear us, you can just switch on your camera and your microphone. We'll have a year okay. in a quick bit. Hello. Can you hear me? There we go. You may start. Oh, good morning, everyone. What is energy intensity? Energy intensity is the amount of energy used to produce an economic output. High levels of energy intensity implies that the economy uses more energy to, uh, to, produce the economic, uh, to produce the economic output. It means that the economy is energy inefficient. But if it uses less energy, it means that the economy is energy efficient. In South Africa, energy intensity levels are currently at 8.5 megajoules, a figure that is considered high when you compare with other BRICS member states. The high levels of energy intensity are mainly influenced by the manufacturing industry, whose uh, energy intensity levels is currently at four megajoules. And according to the Department of Energy and ESCOM, the industry uh, consumes approximately 52% of the energy produced in the country. What has the industry done and the government? They've introduced programs and policies. One of the programs is their post-2015 energy efficiency strategy that aims at reducing energy by energy consumption by the industry by 16% by 2030. And there've been studies that have been conducted, but, uh, but there's less focus on the manufacturing industry. Hence my study um, investigates the factors that influence energy in the manufacturing industry. I'm investigating, foreign, uh, I'm investigating factors such as foreign direct investment, energy prices, total manufacturing value added and trade openness. And I find that foreign direct investment, uh, foreign direct investment reduces energy intensity in the long run, whereas energy prices reduces energy intensity in the short run. Um, total manufacturing value added on the other hand, increases the levels of energy intensity in the industry. And I recommend that uh, foreign direct investment um, should be promoted in the country and the industry should be closely monitored and energy prices should be, uh, energy price reforms should be adopted. I thank you. Well done. Thank you there to uh, another fantastic presentation, Ms. Tandekile Nontubeko Dlamini. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, in, in these times, we, we hope that our energy industry can support us in the long run um, at least we didn't have load shedding for a couple of months now let's hope it, it doesn't return very soon thank you for the presentation and thank you also for the guidance that we hope our government will see one day and hopefully they can um, also use all of your methods now next up we uh, are going to miss samantha ramsey and uh her topic today is the importance of emotional well-being in children with ADHD. So um, again, uh, some of you in the Faculty of Education, I think this is something that you have to deal with on a daily basis, especially in terms of schools. I've been a teacher myself in my life, and this was something that we experienced a lot, children with ADHD. And we can't wait to see what the plan is that Miss Samantha Ramsey has set up for us. Samantha, I hope you are ready to blow us away with your presentation. I know that the judges, uh, they, are, they are sitting at the back and, and, and they can't wait for this one. So Samantha, we're really excited. Please take the stage and please blow us away with your three minute thesis. Imagine yourself in a room where it feels like the walls are closing in. People's voices are getting louder. Your senses are overwhelmed. You start sweating. How would you cope? How would you make friends and maintain relationships? <clears throat> How would you complete a task given to you? This is the daily reality for a child with ADHD experiencing an emotional difficulty such as anxiety. 
ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. A child with ADHD has differences in their brain development, which can affect their emotions, school life, family life, and friendships. ADHD is much more than what you can see on the surface, as you can see by my presentation. <clears throat> ADHD is much deeper rooted, and these children struggle with an array of different challenges, which ultimately negatively impacts their emotional well being. Many of these challenges and stigmas are overlooked. The most shocking thing I found while conducting my research was the extremity of sensory overloads experienced by these children, which often leads to severe emotional outbursts. Did you know that more than 700,000 people die from suicide every single year? In the past 45 years, suicide rates have increased by 60% worldwide, and 90% of those suicide cases are associated with mental health disorders. The World Health Organization predicted that by 2020, that one person would die from suicide every 20 seconds. My research is about understanding what these emotional challenges look like in a child with ADHD. These children often can't express that they feel anxious or overwhelmed. We as parents and teachers need to identify these triggers and be there to support these children emotionally. I will be collecting and analyzing information on emotional difficulties such as anxiety, depression, sensory overloads, and stigmatisms. From this data, I'm piecing together a puzzle, a puzzle that may one day assist future research in limiting and aiding the suicide rates all over the world. I believe it takes multiple small steps to achieve a goal rather than a few extra large steps. Thus, my research may only be a grain of sand in the desert of worldwide suicides, but every grain of sand could help in the long run. By gaining an understanding of these emotional difficulties in children with ADHD, this could help inform the types of therapies we use, the programs we develop, and the support systems we give. After all, we deserve a world with more happiness. Well done. Thank you, Samantha. Don't switch off your camera yet. Um, we, we hear from the judges that, that you guys, are, that you guys are, are so amazing this morning. They need a bit more time uh, to go through their judging. So I'm going to put you on a spot here. I'm just going to ask you a question. Don't worry. You don't have to present anything. You did really well. Thank you for that. I want to know, um, in a presentation like this, what, 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 is, what is the buildup towards a day like this? How much research needs to go into something like this? Um, the research element is quite a lot. I mean, you obviously have been researching for about a year or two to get your thesis to where you want it to be. Um, and then you get this crazy idea to try and compact it into th three minutes, which is slightly insane. Um, so it definitely is um, like scary and nerve wracking, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, my poor husband has heard my three minute thesis, I think 600 times, like you ready to listen to it again today, because I'm ready to tell you again. So it comes to lots of practicing, lots of trial and error. Um, yeah, and just hoping that your message is a good message that's going to help the world. Uh, and when you heard you have to do something in three minutes. So, so just give me an idea. I, I'm not studied as far as you guys have studied. What is what is a typical page number for a normal thesis let's let's give a wild guess um my thesis currently is sitting on a roughly 250 pages and my three minute thesis was one page <laughs> <laughs> okay cool so to bring 250 pages where do you start do you take out every possible word that you can and just keep like the real highlights that will in impress the judges um, so I just started with like the most important aspects, like um, what the challenges are, because um, that's obviously the, the main problem is the challenges. Um, and then also how those main challenges actually affect like the world, because it's although it affects the children with ADHD, they ultimately become adults, you know, and it affects everyone around them. So I just tied my research to the world. Um, and then I explained how my research can then fix the problem, which is what we want. So yeah, I just chose the like main elements and then condensed it into a little speech. <laughs> and then final question from my side towards you, Samantha. Um, you, you said you're married. So um, you, your husband has heard your thesis many times, but 
how is he coping with you researching, studying? Uh, is, is he supporting you and just saying, you know what, go and sit in front of the computer. I'll sort out the meals tonight. Um, shame. No, he's also very supportive. We've only been married for about a month and a week. Um, we got married okay. now in amongst all this chaos. Um, so no, he's very supportive. Um, he's also studying, so we take chances. Um, who's going to study tonight? Who's going to cook dinner? Who's going to study tomorrow night? Who's going to do the washing? So yeah, it's it's nice because we study together, so we can actually like understand each other's perspectives and help each other through the whole process. So yeah, you you need a good support system to get through all of this chaos and well, excitement. Awesome. Well, uh, we wish you well in this competition. Uh, and once again, thank you for that amazing presentation. Now we move on to our first sir of the day, Mr. Judicial Sabatana. And uh, listen to this amazing topic, enhancing the use of problem-based learning by beginner physical sciences teachers while teaching particular nature of matter. Ladies and gentlemen, Judicial Sabatana. Hey, greetings. This study focused on enrichment uh, for facilitation of uh, problem-based learning. So in my study, I was promoting problem-based learning on the beginner fiscal sciences teachers. Beginner fiscal sciences teachers referring to teachers who have recently started teaching, who are within their first five years of, of teaching practice. Now, in my study, uh, I was promoting problem-based learning for two reasons. First, to promote 21st century skills, which are the four C's as I referred to in my study, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and communication, and also for academic achievements. So the problem is that there is a gap between the training and the actual practice of teachers. As a result, teachers find themselves ill-equipped for teaching practices. Therefore, in the study, it was deemed necessary to actually pro uh, uh, develop a teacher professional development where teachers will be actually assisted with using problem-based learning. In the study, the four C's, I actually considered the competencies for actually being able to participate in today's globally interconnected world and also being able to, 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 to pass within the, the subject. And the particular nature of matter was chosen for this study uh, because it is actually presents uh, teaching and learning challenges, which is for both learners and the teachers. And also it is an abstract uh, topic. So as a result, it is important to also note that the understanding of this topic hinges understanding of other topics in chemistry and also physical sciences. So social interdependence theory was actually adopted as a theoretical framework in my study uh, or as a lens. And data was collected by means of uh, self-developed open-ended questionnaires and uh, interviews in the portfolio. And data was analyzed using Saldana's framework, using Politely's adapted rubric, and also Smith et al's uh, rubric for the portfolio. And the main findings of this study show that before the professional development, beginner teachers lacked knowledge of problem-based learning and therefore did not use it. However, after the teacher professional development, teachers could actually implement problem-based learning in promoting the 21st century skills, which also uh, enhanced the pedagogical skills on the teachers. So for these 21st century skills, were for the broader survival as mentioned, and also academic achievements. And this study, or this qualitative study, contributes to the research related to uh, improving beginner physical sciences teachers or beginning physical sciences teachers to use problem-based learning to promote the four C's or the 21st century skills as mentioned in the study. Thank you. Well done, Judicial. Uh, amazing presentation once again. Um, I'm going to start with this question. The name Judicial, where does that come from? I think you give us a bit of background where this interesting name of yours comes from. <laughs> Hey, Louis, honestly speaking, I have no idea where my parents got this name from, uh, especially given that none of them are academics or whatsoever. So the name, I'm still puzzled as to where my name actually came from. If I'm not mistaken, judicial has something to do with, with law, you know. So um, did, did, you, did, you ever, did you ever think when you had to decide what you're going to study, do you think it will be smart to go into the world of law with a name like that? 
No, actually, I never even thought of law. Um, all I wanted to do was focus a lot on physics, but then as time went by, I just started uh, focusing a lot into chemistry and focusing a lot into education chemistry on how do we understand it, how do we teach it, and how do we learn it. Hence, my focus has been on the problem-based learning and uh, focusing on the 21st century skills because the world today does not only focus on your on whether you know the content. It also needs you to have certain skills to be able to communicate with people, to be able to think out of the box, be creative and collaborate with other people in projects and all of that. And um, I, I think in terms of that, you're talking about beginner teachers. Um, what, what is your view on, on where our teachers are currently in South Africa? Do you think um, in, in, in terms of education, where, where, where we're at, do you think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of our teachers? Uh, no, I don't think there's still a lot of work to be done. I think our teachers are up to scratch with what is happening. They are very much informed. Uh, it's just that there are also pressures from the department. People are actually supposed to, to that's why I say the gap which I realized in my study was that uh, the, the university teaching and learning is different to what is happening in the schools. So when you get to the school, you come thinking that you're just gonna be able to teach, but teaching and learning, it's only about maybe 25% of the school environment. There's many other things, administration, there's politics, there's management, there are too many things happening in the school. Like now the previous uh, presenter was talking about ADHD. You meet those learners, you have to deal with them and assist them. It's a whole lot of a uh, situation and they're also under pressure to complete the syllabus and so it's just, uh, I think there's just a misbalance between the university and the real practice. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope this thesis of yours uh, will make a massive difference in education. I'm going to say goodbye to you. and I'm going to call on one of our speakers that uh, I'm going to just talk today about uh, with all of our speakers that I might have missed. And I think let's start with uh, Miss Matlashwane Matabana. I think if you can quickly turn your camera back on for us, your camera and your microphone. Uh, then we can hear you. Hello. Yes, there we go. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask you one quick question. All right. Yes. And uh, it's not a difficult one. <laughs> okay. My question to you is, I want to know, why did you enter? Did you enter to impress everyone with this thesis? Or did we enter for the big money of 12,000 rand? Personally, I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. I, I hadn't been in a situation where I could like present something that meant something. So for me, it was more of, obviously the money did encourage, I mean, monetary value, I mean, it, it does encourage you. But then for me personally, it was me to step out and encourage something that I, it is one of my skills, communication. I wanted to try something new. So, yes, that's well. Well done, and you're doing it great. Um, and we can't wait to hear what the judges think of you. Thank you, uh, Matlashwane. We're going on to our next presenter then. And uh, it is Miss Chiesa Mulasi with a topic today of a criticality study of a spent fuel pool using scale 6.2.3 and MCNP 6.2. Here you go. Ms. Chiesa Mulasi. South Africa is known for our lack of rye, but did you know that you can compare a rye to nuclear? So let me explain a little bit. Imagine you have a piece of wood that doesn't burn out. You want to have a rye and you turn on the wood. Initially, the wood is harmless. You light up the wood, you get the fire. After the rye, the wood is hot above a thousand degrees. Now it's too hot to handle and it's harmful. In order to cool down the wood, you need to place it in a pool for a number of years so it's cool enough to be stored in dry storage. This wood represents nuclear fuel, which then becomes nuclear spent fuel pool, which then becomes nuclear waste when it's burned. The pool then represents the nuclear spent fuel pool. People consider nuclear very dangerous because of the Hiroshima accident. I mean, who can forget the bomb that killed nearly 230,000 people, or the recent Fukushima accident in Japan. Since then, nuclear spent fuel pools and nuclear waste has been of great 
great concern to everybody, especially the big bosses at the International Atomic Energy Agency. My research, though, is not as interesting as bombings or as a nice bri. South Africa has been operating a nuclear plant for over 40 years without any, without any local studies on the spent fuel pool, meaning we are generalizing on the efficiencies and capabilities of our spent fuel pools. Don't get me wrong, in South Africa, operating anything for 40 years without any local studies, without any accident is pretty impressive. Although my research aims to develop a method that will serve as a foundation for future studies on the spent fuel pool, this will give South Africa and, and the whole industry at large a basis to design and improve our current spent fuel pools. As much as I'd like to, start to study the bombings, I'm studying the loading pattern of the, of the nuclear waste in order for it not to react with each other and cause an, explo an explosion. There's a saying that goes, if it's not broken, don't fix it. However, I think in South Africa, it's time we start coming up with um, studies and research that is unique and relevant to us. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations, Chiesa. What a three minute thesis, fantastic work. You had me at Bri. Um, <laughs> so, so before we go into the Bri topic, I think that's, that's an important part of today is um, how you start, you know, how you grip the judges from the start. And I'm only, the, I'm only the program director and you got me at Bri. We're coming to Bri Day in three days time, Heritage Day as we know it, but we just love to Bri along with it. Tell me, uh, are you going to have a Bri on this Heritage Day this year? I think it's a tradition. I have to follow the tradition. Always. You can never say no to a bri. Okay, great. But but what is a typical bri for you? You know, like, what do you like to make? Who do you do it with? What will this Heritage Day look like for you? So for me, a bri, I know it's unconventional, but I am usually the person that marinates the meat and starts the fire. I, I don't trust people's fire starting skills. So I usually start the fire so my heritage day will just be starting the fire and merit and doing the meat and then just letting my friends and family just do everything else i just i just like the fire part uh, I, i'm the man in the house and i do not like to bribe my this is uh, I'm, my wife and i've been married for eight years and she's she's known this from the start i do not bry i make the fire and i usually just invite friends that like to bry so that just makes it fun for us but well done congratulations um how long did this study take you just give us a rough estimate of time um on on, on how long it took for you to prepare this three minute thesis Actually, it took, it took me about two days to, to, to actually get everything together uh, because I actually found out about it like last minute. So I entered last minute, uh, but it took me about two days to just do the research and compile everything. <laughs> so two years from the one, two days from the other one. Well done. Fantastic work, Chiesa Mulasi. Uh, we just received word quickly from our judges. Um, I'm just going over to... Uh, our engineers in the back end. Uh, there are two slides that we just quickly want to show again to our judges. The first one will just be the whole slide of Ms. Matlashwane Matabane. If you can just quickly present that to the judges and just give me a heads up once you have done that. What am I presenting exactly? You don't have to present uh, Matlashwane. They are just going to present your slides quickly to the judges. You okay. can uh, you can just uh, quickly take a breather. Our judges are just going through the slides. They are up now. Uh, and then once that has shown, then you can also please show us. Um, yeah, you can just go through the slides. I think, uh, engineers, you can just go through the slides one by one of uh, Matlashwane that they can just quickly go through. And then once that is done, you can also show us once again uh, Lisa Merida Lange's presentation as well. Again, Lisa Marie, you don't have to present anything. Our judges just need to see Lisa Marie's uh, presentation as well. We'll just then wait for a word from our judges once they are happy. And then we will go into our final speaker before we take a short break.
All right. So now that the judges have seen that, we go into our final speaker for this round. And this is Miss Nwatladi Mashilangako with the topic evolution of SIC cladded annular fuel as accident tolerant fuel for PWRs. Here we go. By a show of hands, how many of you in this room think about bombs when you hear the word nuclear? Anybody at the back row? Okay, I ask this because that is the first thing people say when I tell them that I'm studying nuclear engineering. I, for one, have watched one too many John Rambo films, particularly Rambo 4. In this movie, John Rambo was encircled by the Thermidor soldiers, and in order to flee, he triggered the nuclear Grand Slam bomb, which had been abandoned during World War II. People also think about Fukushima when I talk about the Fukushima nuclear accident when I talk about nuclear. Okay, how about we look at nuclear in the context of energy, medical isotopes, and economical benefits? South Africa is facing a significant increase in energy demand, necessitating greater capacity from clean, clean energy technologies, such as nuclear power. Nuclear power is produced from light water reactors, which have risen to fame in the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster and led to the development of accident tolerant fuels. Accident tolerant fuels desires to improve fuel safety and performance under normal and accident operating conditions. The title of my study is Silicon evaluation of silicon carbide cladded annular fuel as accident tolerant fuels for pressurized water reactors. My research seeks to determine whether annular fuel rods with silicon carbide cladding can be used as a replacement for the current fuel. Silicon carbide has properties that allow it to resist temperatures higher than the current cladding. Annular fuel rods have a hole in the middle that allows for coolant to pass through and reduce central heat accumulations. These upgrades will not only address safety concerns, but they will also boost nuclear reactor power output. Because we are in the 5G era, I am basing my concept on computer software codes. Next time, when you hear the word nuclear, please don't think about John Rambo. Please don't think about the Fukushima disaster. Instead, think about a South Africa free of load shedding. Thank you. Well done, uh, Ladi. That's uh, am I saying it correct? Yes, that's good. Uh, uh, well, uh, again, you you got us at load shedding. Um, I, I think that's 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 one thing that we're struggling with. Let me hear from you uh, while doing this presentation, while doing your thesis, while doing all of your studies. How has load shedding impacted you? Were there some certain times where you just couldn't sit in front of your computer because of no power? Certainly, um, one too many times, uh, and, and, and also including that we are learning remotely now. Sometimes you find that there's a class, but you have load shedding. Sometimes I find myself in your McDonald's um, somewhere around here because you know you have particular sections. So I'll drive to the next section where I know they don't have load shedding at this particular time just to attend a class, and then I have to come back. So it's funny how you walk into McDonald's with your backpack and your your Wi-Fi router and then everybody's staring and you have to order a meal just to occupy the space. So it hasn't been an easy task. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, South Africa, maybe that we can adopt more nuclear plants and then we can actually address this um, energy issue. Um, and, and tell me the, the life of COVID that we're having now um, in terms of your, your, you're talking about online classes. How have you adapted? Uh, are, you, are you liking the process of, of being able to, to not attend classes, but rather attend them virtually? Um, it's, 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 it's a bit of both. Um, on a personal level, I think it was good for me that I didn't have to relocate to Porch. I would stay at home with my two-year-old and my husband. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I miss social interaction with fellow classmates. And now it's very hard to just form friendships with your classmates. You have to, it's very hard. Unlike when we're meeting in person, we just click and we start having communication and we start working together. So I'm just 50-50 on this whole COVID situation. Uh, and and how do you, uh, we, we heard from, from one of our previous um, uh, uh, presenter Samantha she's just married now 
But you're talking about having a kid in home as well while studying. How is that working out for you? Oh, just that I didn't worry. When I was preparing for this competition, like on Friday, on, on Thursday, when I had to pre-record a video, every time I come in front of my computer and I'm like, hi guys, my name is this and she'll come in the background. So I had to re-record more than five times until she was exhausted and stopped talking in the background. But I'm just loving every moment of her. I think she's learning a lot from mommy when she sees me doing all these things. I think it's inspiring her in a way. Well done. You are inspiring. And it was a, an amazing three minute thesis. Uh, there, there is one presenter that we've missed for this Q&A. Uh, and that is Tandekile Nontu Bekot Lamini. I think if you are still in the background and you can switch on your camera and your microphone for us. Are you still with us? Tandekile Nontu Bekot. There we go. There you are. Right, Tande Kile, um, I, I think the same question goes for you. Um, uh, what does it take to enter a competition like this? Is it, is it a lot of work? Is it a lot of research? Is it a lot of time? Um, how did you experience the, this whole three-minute thesis? Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think entering such a competition is, yeah, it is a lot of research, a lot of time, and a lot of trying to understand what exactly I do you want to talk about? What exactly do you want people to get from you? It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a platform where you want to share who you are to the people. So I think it is, it is a good platform to also put yourself out there. <laughs> yes. uh, of course. And uh, wh what do you want to achieve by putting yourself out there? I know uh, some people have said that, it's a challenge for themselves. You know, they, 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 they maybe not really speakers in front of a lot of people putting themselves out there. Uh, some people might put themselves out there to, to further their studies. Uh, what is, what is your thinking about putting myself out there? Um, I think um, my thinking about putting myself out there um, as you grow professionally, you want, um, you, you want to develop that confidence. I'm a shy person. So this is me trying to put myself out there. <laughs> you're, you're doing really good. So well done. And then a uh, final question from my side. Uh, uh, what, is the, what does the future look like for, for Tandekile uh, in terms of studies, in terms of professionally growing? Uh, what is that future looking like? Um, okay, um, because we're in this pandemic thing, it's a bit gloomy, but then <laughs> I've currently finished my, 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 my thesis. I've currently finished uh, the master's thesis. So I'm thinking of registering for PhD or also do other, <laughs> also do other certificates, may branch into another, into a different field, probably, let me just say competition field. Well done. Well, we can't wait to call you Dr. Tandekile next year in the competition. Uh, congratulations um, and well done. And uh, yeah, all, all of good luck from, our, from me and uh, towards the judges. We hope they give you a great score today. So ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking a quick break. It is now five minutes to 10. 10 past 10, we will continue. Uh, I think it's just a quick gap for everyone. Run to the bathroom, grab a glass of water, make some coffee. And then we'll see you back here at 10 past 10. So it's 5 to 10 now, 10 past 10. We will continue uh, with a bunch of speakers. We still have roughly quick mathematics, eight speakers left for today. So uh, we can't wait to still hear what they have in store for us. I'll see you back here at 10 past 10.
We have two minutes till we start again, everybody. Two minutes till we start again. Thank you. Stand by. Welcome back to Three Minute Thesis. Just a quick reminder, while we are here today, we're here to celebrate the exciting research conducted by master's students developed by the University of Queensland. The exercise cultivates students' academic presentation and research communication skills. The competition supports their capacity to effectively explain their research and its significance in three minutes, three minutes only in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. Well, we've had some amazing speakers this morning, and uh, I hope you all had a great break. I hope, I hope you all ran to the bathroom quickly, made yourself some coffee, grabbed something for, for the thirst, because here we go. Eight speakers left, eight presenters left that are going to blow our socks off, and we can't wait for this first one. So the topic for Ms. Reina Mulapo is the factors that predispose divorce in Limpopo, South Africa, a qualitative description. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now welcome Ms. Reina Mulapo. Good morning. My name is Ms. Reina Mulapo. I am here today to present to you on factors that predispose divorce in Limpopo, which is a qualitative description. We all know that divorce is no longer a personal issue, but rather a societal one. Many scientists and researchers have joined forces. I have also joined them and investigated, and we almost came to the same findings like that Divorce is caused by factors such as infidelity, abuse, poor parenting, just to list a few. These things work in a circle. When we look at these factors, they are closely linked to the emotions and feelings that people go through. The emotional state of a person who is undergoing divorce has the, the capacity of deteriorating their mental health capacity. And when we talk about mental health, at times we find that some people are unable to live with themselves, are even unable to live with others. And therefore, we find that there are elements such as parental alienation. So we move from one person into the whole lot of a lot of people that are involved in this circle. When you struggle with mental health illness, then you develop issues that 
hinder you from showing your signs of being compassionate. Therefore, we are here today to encourage everybody to say we need to sharpen and develop therapeutic interventions that are there that will help to equip an individual with skills of mastering themselves so that when we master ourselves, we are able to create lasting relationships that are open to helping an individual to inspire, to influence and be the best that they can be. But we can only do that when we are able to develop the inner self compassion within all of us. Therefore, with this model today, I'm here to say to you that let us all join together and fight divorce. This is not just for, for individuals, but also for everyone. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. Uh, what a thesis there by Ms. Reina Molapo. Uh, Reina, I'm going to speak to you a bit later on. I still have a couple of questions I'm going to ask you, but we'll keep you for a bit later. Firstly, I want to want to introduce all of our viewers today to a co-host, my co-program director. I'm going to put her camera on now. Sharonika, if you can join me on screen. There we go. This is Sharonika Nell, and uh, Sharonika is going to take over from me in, in, a, in a bit of time. I unfortunately have another errand I have to run to, uh, but I got the best of the best, uh, Sharonika Nell, and uh, she's joining me on screen. Sharonika, how are you today? Well, Louis, I'm kind of, after three minutes of listening to the two pieces that I actually heard now, um, feeling that I need to step up my game in my professional life because uh, the standards are quite high. Uh, Sharonika, have you have you ever considered studying further, taking your studies a bit further? Um, maybe today will inspire you. I've got to tell you, Lou, um, it was a journey that I started years ago. And that's why I can tell everybody listening right now that I have the utmost respect for anyone that is willing to take on this challenge because it is time consuming and it was so ironic that you said that you had an errand to run. Um, I think errands have been on the back burner for all of these participants for months and years right now and there are only 24 hours in a day but I think any postgraduate student doing any type of research has the the ability to find 50 hours a day because that's the only possible reason I can find for the incredible research coming out of these theses. So you've just joined us, but I need to give you a bit of background. So, so we, we, have, we have mothers here uh, participating today. We have people that have been married for five weeks. So it's still the honeymoon phase and, and still they're getting it right to present a thesis in three minutes. Uh, one of our contestants mentioned that she, she had two years uh, of planning and all of that, 250 pages, something like that, being put into a one page three minute thesis. Uh, do you think that is something that you, you'll ever attempt? You and I, we're not afraid to speak in front of people, but not something academically like this. Absolutely. I think you're taking the words right out of my mouth because I keep thinking that um, in, in our lines of work, we, we literally, we're paid to talk. And the more we talk, the better, because that's, that's what we do. And I cannot fathom how these incredible people are shoving their research into three minutes and it still makes sense. I think that is the talent that we're seeing here today because despite the research and everything that goes into that, it's even more impressive that you can present it within three minutes and it still makes sense to people who might actually have no idea what your research is about. So, so, the, so for the people that don't know you, you coming from a radio background, radio presenting um, and radio managing as well. But, but in terms of radio presenting, we get the opportunity to talk a lot of nonsense. Um, and, and I don't think in this case, it's nonsense at all. Um, it, it's, it's probably nothing that we can compare ourselves with what they're doing, right? No, absolutely. I keep thinking that in the radio industry, we talk about the shorter your link is, the better and you have to say everything that you want to say 
in a allocated amount of time. So we try to encourage people not to talk a lot of nonsense. And uh, <laughs> I would really like to say that each and every participant here, if at one stage you would like to take a month or two break from your field of research, please try a radio because apparently you are already 90% there in being able to talk absolute sense that makes a difference in the world. I think that's very important to note. In three minutes. That's something very few people can do. And to be quite honest, a uh, majority of people on radio cannot. Well, uh, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, I think it's time to introduce our next uh, presenter. And uh, we are going to get a lot of value from this topic. Listen to this one. Micronutrient deficiency correction in children, six to 59 months with severe acute malnutrition admitted to Ghanaian and South African hospitals in comparison with WHO 2013 guidelines. That is what you call a mouthful. Uh, and here we go. Miss Doris Nanga. Do we have Doris on the line there? Doris, if you can just give us an indication if your camera and your microphone is on. There we go. Hi. Yes, here I am. Can I start? You may start. Yes, please. Okay, so this is Doris Nanga. I studied the practice of health care workers on macronutrient deficiency correction among infants and children admitted to Ghanaian and South African hospitals with a severe acute malnutrition. Severe acute malnutrition is a huge problem in Africa, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, and these children are prone to micronutrient deficiencies. The World Health Organization, that is the, the BHO, from time to time provide guidance on how to manage these infants when they are admitted to our hospitals. So the last time that the BHO updated its guidelines was in 2010, I mean 2013. So we did not have information on if the updated guidelines are being implemented at hospital level. So this is study aimed at assessing the uh, health workers practice on micronutrient deficiency correction if it's in line with the updated guidelines. So we collected the uh, data from medical records of infants admitted to hospital during the period of 2013 to 2019. And uh, the data collected included what type of micronutrient is being given, uh, how much, and when it is started and stopped. So upon analyzing, we found out that the correction of micronutrient deficiency was not fully according to the updated guidelines in terms of what type of micronutrient to give, at what time, and how much to give. So we did a literature search to find out possible reasons why uh, uh, health workers may not be able to implement the well said guidelines. And we found that when there are no enough resources and also if there is no knowledge, uh, chances are high that the health workers may not be able to implement well set guidelines. And because of that, we uh, recommend that when the guidelines have been, uh, have been rolled out, there must be continuous training among health workers who are directly involved in the management of children with severe acute malnutrition. And uh, also we are recommending uh, further studies to find out uh, specific facilitators and barriers to implement uh, the WHO guidelines regarding uh, management of severe acute malnutrition, including uh, correction of uh, uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So thank you for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Don't go anywhere. Uh, oh, well done on your presentation. Great stuff. Again, how to achieve that in three minutes blows my mind. But uh, tell me quickly about the Ghanaian reference in your topic. Um, where does it come from? Uh, is, is, is that your, your country of birth? I'm asking out, out of ignorance. So I'm, I'm basically from Malawi. I'm now currently in Malawi right now. And uh, I am part of the big study. It calls, it's called the SAMAC study. It's a study in five countries in Africa, including Ghana, South Africa, Malawi, Kenya, and Botswana. So mine was a sub-study, and the, I used secondary data from this big study uh, that collected, already collected data from all these countries. So that's why I got uh, a chance of uh, being able to analyze data even from Ghana. 
That that is amazing. Um, so we're going international today. And uh, what are you currently doing in in Malawi? Okay, so because of COVID, studying at home, and yeah, I'm busy with the finalizing uh, my write up. Uh, I'm also a mother. I'm a mother of two, and you know, yeah. So it's 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 been not easy, but yeah, uh, I managed, yes. Uh, uh, tell me about that not being easy. Um, you're sitting in a different country. Uh, I know our students are, some of them are 50 to 100 kilometers away from campus. You're sitting in a totally different country. Um, how have you been experiencing studying from home and, and now technically studying abroad? How have you found that in a, in a time of COVID? Was it difficult for you? Yeah, it's it's been difficult, especially uh, like the um, it's 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 delayed. I mean, the pace is not the same as as I, when I was uh, in South Africa in in Porch. So, yeah, a lot of things. Internet is a problem in our country. In my pay, in my place, uh, sometimes gadgets have a problem. When you want something the, for IT people to help you, it takes ages. Even the computer, the 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 other my, my programs, it's, it's not been easy, but it's manageable, though it's time consuming. Instead of two years, I'm now in my third year. Yeah, so that, that has been... <laughs> like that is but well done yeah you've done a great job and thank you for joining us today uh, that was doris nanga and uh, i'm going to keep over to sharonika sharonika who do we have up next for a three-minute thesis thank you so much louis and uh, i just also from my side want to say congratulations doris just not only on the actual presentation, but for making it this far with all the challenges. And I think to all the participants today, every time we hear a sentence beginning with because of COVID, we all know exactly what that is about. So we'd like to please welcome our next speaker. It's Ms. Kshena Fakir. And this is a very, very interesting thesis that I'm so looking forward to hear these three minutes because it's about the sense of belonging in community-based care among South African older persons. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Dear South Africa, I met a 70-year-old man who spoke in a gloomy tone. He said that his children have moved away, he lives alone, and the next generation has such a different way of thinking and living in the world. This made me wonder about older people's place in the world and what it means to belong for them. This is important because globally we have achieved unprecedented increases in our older population. South Africa is not exempt from this growth and expects exponential increases over the next 30 years. Along with this, our older population is predominantly affected by chronic diseases. These factors are related to a growing need of long-term care for older people. Alongside this need, I am interested in sense of belonging. When we have a look at policy, the Older Persons Act prioritizes older people's well-being and advocates for community-based care. Community-based care being traditional community life, participation, and accessing care nearby the home. However, while policy indicates what community-based care entails, South Africa is far from the implementation thereof on a practical level. Furthermore, factors such as unemployment and HIV AIDS hamper an ideal aging trajectory. Considering the South African context, evidence showing that older people face obstacles such as loneliness and social isolation is crucial. Being ignored by family members, especially those older people living alone and having limited opportunity for interaction is a reality. By knowing this evidence, it's important to note that belonging is an important feature of well-being, and this must be taken seriously. My research looked at existing studies to see how they describe sense of belonging for South African older people in community-based care. Firstly, I found that tangible or physical aspects, as well as intangible or those aspects which cannot be touched, work in unity to allow for a sense of belonging. For example, a physical or tangible daycare center was able to feature intangible aspects such as relationships, participation, and engagement among older people. 
Secondly, South African older people prefer interdependence. There is value found in relations with others. Lastly, I found that within policies, frameworks, and guidelines, various sectors address concepts related to belonging, but there was a gap in focusing explicitly on sense of belonging. Despite there being a gap in the research, these results are vital to understanding our South African older population, but it concerns you and me too, who will one day reach old age. And aside from securing our own feelings of belonging, these people, these older people have invaluable wisdom. And it's important to value their contributions for society to flourish in the long term. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Kashina. And I have to immediately touch on literally your last sentence about this extremely valuable um, part that older people play in our communities. From your side, uh, if you could maybe highlight one or two insights that you maybe would like to share for with regards to if you had to speak to a younger community, because we know what a big responsibility we have, not only the fact that we are going to be there one day, what insights would you like to share with a younger community about how we can actually contribute and take on this responsibility of enhancing this community sense in our older people? Yes, I think I think nowadays we're all kind of going for the more uh, the youthful approach and we try to value youth a lot, but I think it's equally important where we need to be aware of our youth and live that day by day, we also need to be aware that when you get older, you obviously are getting wiser and you've got a lot of experience with you. So yeah, I think to be able to bridge the gap between the older and the younger generation is something so important and crucial that we need to be aware of. And I think we, we can see that in our daily lives, whether it's with our grandparents, our parents, or just the community around us, there's so much that we can learn. And if we're not sure about something, we obviously go and ask somebody else with more experience. So that's that's a first step to show us that there's value in people who have more experience and wisdom. And it's not wrong to ask for, for help from others. Absolutely. And I have to say again, congratulations on the presentation and what an interesting topic to go in because these are conversations that we have with, with our parents and those of us who are lucky enough to still have our grandparents. So I think something like this is a great step into hopefully opening the eyes of the younger generation to make a difference because like you said as well, there's an extreme amount of wisdom and I almost want to say swallow our pride because uh, there's a quote that says, I'm not young enough to know everything. And I tend to disagree with that quote because we do really need all the help and guidance we can get as, as a global community and within families. And I think to take this opportunity as well to everybody who's listening, if you do have the opportunity to speak to your grandparents, the second you get off this conference, please do that because there's a lot of value in it. And uh, make sure you actually check out Kashin's research. If you don't believe me, she's a lot smarter than I am and she's got the numbers oh. to back it. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Our next speaker is something that, again, I think I'm going to say this so many times today. It's, this is so extremely interesting. And I think important as well. We've seen so, so many conversations going on in this disconnected time that we're living in about the importance of the arts, of music, of escapism through music, and the, ironically, how important it is to foster this kind of love in the younger generation. So our next speaker is Ms. Vilmi Swanepoel, and her research focuses on exploring the teaching and learning experiences that foster musical engagement in extracurricular individual music lessons during late childhood. Again, what a mouthful. And I'm not gonna say anything more, Ms. Wonderful, because I have to hear what you have to say in these next three minutes. Thank you so much. And a good morning to everyone listening. I'll jump off and say, let us all climb into a time traveling capsule and travel back to an age where you were playing the next bass drumming solo on your mother's pots or playing the most beautiful lullaby on your recorder <laughs> while the other people in your household might not have been as impressed as you were with your newfound music skills. The fact of the matter is that you 
for making music. Music is the universal language through which we all communicate. And I think that is why we are still stuck singing the same happy birthday song at birthday parties. The title of my presentation, Please Don't Stop the Music, is not just a well-known song by Rihanna. It's also something I would like to see happen in the future. Through many conversations I had with friends, colleagues, family members, and basically anyone willing to talk, I came to the interesting conclusion that most people pursued an instrument as a child, went for music lessons, but gave up or stopped their music lessons somewhere along the way. As a music teacher and music student myself, I felt motivated to try and understand why this happened to so many. By studying articles and conducting interviews with six music teachers, I came to the interesting conclusion that there are many factors that play a role in ensuring that learners are musically engaged in their individual music lessons. Interestingly enough, the most important factor was actually the relationship between the music teacher and the music learner. In the famous words of John Donne, no man is an island. The same principle is found in the well-known Ubuntu term, ah, Nguni term, Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. As humans, we exist through the relationships we have with others. The relationship between the music teacher and music learner is so crucial to ensure that learners are musically engaged. This relationship that we have between music teacher and learner is fostered within an individual music lesson setting and nurtured by music. So why then is it so important to ensure that learners are musically engaged in their individual music lessons? Because we need learners who will grow up as parents who might just join in on their children's drum solo one day. Thank you so much. Well done, uh, Vilmi. Uh, what a great uh, thesis there. What a great presentation. First, first things first. First, uh, how many times have you hit those spots in your parents' home? That's that's what I want. <laughs> Too many times. You can ask them. <laughs> since I've been studying for seven years, I think they might have known from the beginning something is going to happen. <laughs> but, but I want to ask you that. So, so many many people kind of go into a, pro a profession one day and then their parents will say something like yeah we knew from the start you know he was always studying jokes and now he's a comedian or or she was always making food now she's a chef uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're in the in the in the study of music was that something that they always kind of knew and you always kind of knew and wanted to do yes um i started my individual music lessons from the age of eight and I just loved every moment of it. So I started with the piano and then I moved on to guitar and violin and every moment I loved it. And sure, there was the aspect of, is it a good idea financially <laughs> to go into studying music? And I just realized this, my passion is too great to not do it. And that's why I pursued it. And this, my parents knew. <laughs> I think I think you're you're one of the, you're not the only one. You're just one of the first uh, presenters today to mention it, and that's passion. Um, mm. Sometimes we 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 often go into a profession just because they pay well, <laughs> um, and I don't know if that's if that's the fact with with music. Um, so, uh, how much passion do you need to do this full time? A lot. <laughs> Very much because, um, okay, well, as music, I'm a music teacher myself, so I, I don't do bad, but if I were to study um, something like CA or go into IT, which I was actually thinking of doing because those were my subjects at school, um, it didn't give the same satisfaction. I love working with children and seeing the, the value of music in their lives. And that just makes up for everything else, even the financial <laughs> implications. <laughs> That's that. It, it, one day it will pay off, and and uh, we're so we're so happy to hear that from you. Well done, th uh, congratulations, and thank you to uh, Vilmi. And next up, we go to Miss Annabelle Marie with the topic: adult amateur cellists engaging in individual lessons and narrative inquiry. Let's welcome Ms. Annabelle Murray. Good morning, everyone. 
Okay, can you hear me? Okay. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start. Imagine you are 48 years old. You always had this dream. You are inspired by the dream. You always wanted to learn a to play the cello. Let's say you meet up with a teacher. You start taking cello lessons. After a few days, she tells you, well done. Well done. You are doing so good. After a few weeks, she even tells you, here's a few new pieces to try out. And after a few months, she even tells you, uh, try to join the cello ensemble. See how it goes. And after a while that you have tried this, you realize you feel empowered. You get a new identity. It feels like you belong somewhere, making music with others, make, playing the cello, making music with some violins um, and maybe a pianist. So why am I telling you the story? My research is about six adult amateur cellists engagement in individual cello lessons and their engagement in this lessons and how their life stories went. Um, I chose a qualitative study and I chose a narrative design. I chose a narrative design because the life stories of these people or these adult learners are very important. Their life stories before they started with the cello, their life stories um, while they were busy engaging with the cello and how their lives changed after playing the cello. Um, so writing a story has a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And the beginning of the story is what and who are these people before they started with the cello? What was their dreams? What was their goals? What was their motivation to start? Um, the middle of the story um, in my data analysis was how did cello change their lives for good or for bad? How did it change their families? How did they, they, it change the perspective on music, on people, on their workplaces? And the end of the story is, okay, what is their goals now? What have they achieved with the cello? Um, how can they inspire other adults? And the purpose of this, uh, this study and my study is how can um, this study and this life stories of these adult amateur cellists um, inspire um, teachers of adult learners? How can they better engage with um, uh, better engage with adult learners, um, understand their goals, understand their motivations? How can teacher better understand adults? And also, um, my my research can also inspire other adults who wants to try something new, um, who always had this dream of something they. They always wanted to do as a child and now they can do it and read these life stories of these adults and be like, okay, yes, I also want to do it. And just imagine if all adults can start with instruments that I've always wanted to do or uh, get up and play an instrument that they've stopped doing when they were children, the world would be a better place. Thank you. Wow, Annabelle, thank you so much. That was inspiration in three minutes. <laughs> And I have to ask you in this time that we are living in currently, and I mentioned it earlier, the importance of the arts for you as you went through your research and you are engaging with this topic on literally a daily basis. What, in your opinion, would be the importance and the role of music? And you can link it to your research in this time that we're living in right now. I think it's really important, especially in this COVID time that we have went through now. And people go through a lot of emotional stuff, um, stuff with families. Um, the whole world is changed now. And I think music has a really essential part in everybody's life, even if it's not just music that you play, but just music that you listen to. Um, music is so connected to our emotions and what we think and what we feel and memories and nostalgia that we had with people or moments we had with special people. Um, so music, especially in this time today, I think is really important. I think it can help with our emotional well-being. Um, and I'm not, I'm not even speaking about making music with people. That is just amazing. And that is also something for this last two years, um, like mu making music with people was like a gathering. So it was prohibited, but now it's like just more amazing. Um, making music with people, that collaboration and seeing people again and I don't know, like meaning something to people out there, um, making music for people that they can listen to. Um, so I think it's really important for our well-being in this time, especially. Ms. Adabel Murray, thank you so very much. And uh, that was a, a goosebumps answer. And I know, Lou, you would absolutely agree with me. 
You know, uh, it, I've been getting goosebumps the whole day. You know, um, it, as I've as I've mentioned before, these these people are so further along the line in terms of their studies than than I'll probably ever be. I aspire to be like them, but I just I just think the effort that goes into the planning and the presenting today is is something that we can commend and um yeah i think all of them can really be proud and then they give answers like this you know this is not something that that they that they present that they prepared for us we give them a question on the spot and still they have the courage to answer it with wonderful answers like that so yeah it's it's really an amazing experience to be part of this today Absolutely. And uh, like I said, I'm quite jealous that you could have done the first half as well. I think I'm going back to all the recordings and listen to the rest as well. <laughs> yes, you have to. Uh, you really have to. But it is it is almost time for me to greet you guys. Um, Sharonika, I, I know I know you you are the person that can really take this forward. And uh, I can't wait to to see later on in this week who the winners of this competition will be. Um, and and I, I don't know if you've heard this. But I've mentioned earlier on, it's a 12,000 rand prize for the first for the first place. <laughs> you and oh I can do word. a lot for 12,000 rand, eh? <laughs> Jeez, but I'm also looking at the quality here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to tell the judges that um, my, my deepest, deepest apologies for your job today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to, to make the right decision for the 12,000 rand. Well... Sharonika, it is time for me to greet you guys. Um, I'm going to introduce the last speaker from my side. Then there are still a bunch of speakers left once I've left. But uh, good luck with the rest. And thank you to everyone uh, tuning in for this great opportunity, for me being part of this. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, there, and then I will leave you alone in the hands of Sharonika now. And uh, next up, we are listening to a critical analysis of the rights of employees in fixed term contracts, the right to reasonable expectation. Let's now welcome Mr. Moremi Radebe. Just waiting for that presentation now, to come. The study online. aims to critically analyze the development and strides made in effecting protection to employees on a fixed term contract. The Labor Relations Act defines a fixed term contract as an employment agreement which terminates upon the completion of a specific task or upon the expiration of a certain period of time. There has been an increase in the use of non standard employment relationships, more particularly fixed term contracts. Although there is an honest need for these type of employment agreements in relation to employers' operational needs in certain circumstances, however, the utilization of these type of contracts has resulted in abuse by unscrupulous employers to the detriment of fixed term contract employees. Now factors such as a highly competitive global market has resulted in unscrupulous employers opting for a more flexible employment relationship in an effort to avoid legal obligations required by the Labor Relations Act, such as contributions to the medical aid, UIF or pension fund, as well as more crucially, as far as our discussion today is concerned, employment security or dismissal as an employee can unfairly be let go after the termination of the fixed term contract. Although there was an expectation that the contract will be renewed on either similar terms or indefinitely, and the employer fails to do so and lets the contract run its course. Now, the Labor Relations Act, together with its subsequent amendments, was then enacted to provide a solution to this problem and provides that in certain circumstances, dismissal includes the non renewal of a fixed term contract, either on the same or similar terms or indefinitely, where the employee had a reasonable expectation of renewal and the employer fails to do so. The legislature did not, however, provide a definition of what constitutes reasonable expectation. And then this created legal uncertainty pertaining to this issue. It was then left to our court system to determine what constitutes reasonable expectation. Although a definition was not given, the courts provided different examples, and this can relate to the number of times a fixed term contract has been extended, the conduct of the employee to make the employee, employer to make the employee believe that the contract will be extended, 
and whether there is a vacancy in the company. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but then this is to name a few. If it has been found that indeed a reasonable expectation existed, then the employee can rely on unfair dismissal and be reinstated either on the same or similar terms or indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation by Mr. Murebi Radebe. And like I said, my pen has been working overtime in the last three minutes to make sure I take all the notes that I need to go forward with my own contract with any future employer as well. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to quickly go back to Ms. Reina Malopo. Like uh, Louis mentioned earlier, that of course was the presentation that we had about factors that predispose divorce in Limpopo. And I have to say that this has been in my mind since your presentation, Reina. I have to ask you, this is a very sensitive topic and people aren't necessarily so inclined always to have a conversation about this. Uh, was this a challenge for you during your research? Yes, there were a lot of challenges. You know, when participants, actually even when friends, when you talk to somebody who has divorced and when they reenact that experience, yes. reliving it, it's still painful. You realize that uh, many people live with anger, sadness, and um, they have some questions that are not even answered. You know, some people do not even know why they were divorced. Even now, ten years later, it still haunts them. They still want answers, and unfortunately, there's the partner who's supposed to answer that is not there anymore. So those are some of the challenges encountered. So that's that's heartbreaking. I'm literally mm -hmm. sitting here with almost tears in my eyes with regards to this because uh, research like this has to take a, an emotional toll on the researcher as well because you you hear these stories and and you see this. How as a researcher do you deal with that aspect of the challenge? Because we tend to focus on all the logistics behind research, but not just necessarily about the emotional toll it takes on you as a researcher. Mm. You know, there's uh, the therapeutic significance of being there for someone. Although some of the people may not be happy or willing to go for counseling, they are willing to talk to people, even strangers, to people that they don't know. So for some people, the, when the researcher is there to talk to them, that's an opportunity for them to, to release those pent up feelings, you know, to let go of what they have bottled inside of them. Some may even not agree to undergo counseling because as a researcher, we, I don't do counseling, but I arrange with another professional to, to, to assist them with counseling services, they would refuse. But that opportunity of being in a research uh, session with them, they capitalize on it to talk about their feelings. Thank you so much, Reda. And I think it just reiterates the fact that the researcher is such, such a big role to play, even yes. above the thesis. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. And it's time for us to move over to our next speaker, Ms. Jackie Miller, will be taking us through a journey of evaluating the time, scope, and cost of human labor versus digital process automation capabilities. Please welcome Ms. Jackie Miller. The fourth and fifth industrial revolution are taking the world by storm with automation at the forefront of what our future is going to look like. Automation, is currently used in a way that makes it easier for us as humans to interact with and experience it. Automation is also used to remove any repetitive and non-complex tasks from a person's day-to-day -day activities. This allows us more time to spend on human intuitive tasks. Those are essentially the tasks that bots cannot take away from us. Now that is a very scary thought, isn't it? It comes with a lot of questions. Could automation 
result in me losing my job? Well, no, not really. See, automation could allow you to rather focus your energy, your time and your skills on something that may be considered to be more human intuitive. All right, okay, so that then means that automation is the answer to everything, right? Well, no, there are cases where automation might not be the best way to do something. Okay, so then how do we know when automation is the best way to do something? Brilliant question, and that is what my research aims to answer. When we think about automation, we may get worried when we think that it could do the same work that we could do, just better, cheaper, and maybe even faster. These are the assumptions we make when we think about automation, but how do we actually measure that an automation is cheaper, that it is faster, and that it is better? My research was performed in a case study environment where a specific process was defined. I then built out the automation and observed it, executing the process in terms of time, cost, and scope. I also observed the employee executing the process in their own environment, and in doing so, I was able to understand the factors that influence time, cost, and scope. The importance of this is to identify the difference between the value that we think an automation has and the actual measurable value that an automation has once it has been implemented, so that in the future, we can better understand how we can minimize cost, maximize savings, or even understand the impact that this has on quality. The opportunities are limitless. Just because it can be automated doesn't mean that it should be automated. Automation is great, just as long as you know where to put the machine. Please stand by everyone, we have a little bit of technical difficulty. Please stand by everyone, we have a technical difficulty. Thank you so, so very much to Miss Jackie Miller. Now, again, uh, like Louis mentioned, and we had the conversation before, this amazing, amazing initiative has, of course, the cash prize, and our winners will be announced a little bit later in the week. And we know this has previously been done by UFS in April, and we were lucky enough to receive an inv invitation to also form part of this incredible, incredible initiative. This is the first three-minute thesis event at the Northwest University, and we do hope to do this more often because, again, I have to reiterate this every single time because... It has been such an incredible opportunity to hear the research that every single participant does. And again, in three minutes, that's incredible. And I'd like to give a compliment to all the participants as well, as we know that it is an incredible journey that you take to do this research. It's a very, very important step for you to actually decide to take on this postgraduate journey. So we would just like to quickly go through Ms. Jackie Miller's presentation again, um, as we know at this stage because of 
technical difficulties sometimes. This is the world that we're living in right now. So you actually have the opportunity to get to listen to Ms. Jackie Miller's presentation again about evaluating the time, scope, and cost of human labor versus digital process automation capabilities. The fourth and fifth industrial revolution are taking the world by storm with automation at the forefront of what our future is going to look like. Automation is currently used in a way that makes it easier for us as humans to interact with and experience it. Automation is also used to remove any repetitive and non-complex tasks from a person's day-to-day -day activities. This allows us more time to spend on human intuitive tasks. Those are essentially the tasks that bots cannot take away from us. Now that is a very scary thought, isn't it? It comes with a lot of questions. Could automation result in me losing my job? Well, no, not really. See, automation could allow you to rather focus your energy, your time and your skills on something that may be considered to be more human intuitive. All right, okay, so that then means that automation is the answer to everything, right? Well, no, there are cases where automation might not be the best way to do something. Okay, so then how do we know when automation is the best way to do something? Brilliant question, and that is what my research aims to answer. When we think about automation, we may get worried when we think that it could do the same work that we could do, just better, cheaper, and maybe even faster. These are the assumptions we make when we think about automation, but how do we actually measure that an automation is cheaper, that it is faster, and that it is better? My research was performed in a case study environment where a specific process was defined. I then built out the automation and observed it executing the process in terms of time, cost and scope. I also observed the employee executing the process in their own environment and in doing so I was able to understand the factors that influence time, cost and scope. The importance of this is to identify the difference between the value that we think an automation has and the actual measurable value that an automation has once it has been implemented, so that in the future we can better understand how we can minimize cost, maximize savings, or even understand the impact that this has on quality. The opportunities are limitless. Just because it can be automated doesn't mean that it should be automated. Automation is great, just as long as you know where to put the machine. And that was Miss Jackie Miller for her three minute thesis. Now, uh, as we said earlier, uh, I'm really gonna take this opportunity to blow up the egos of our participants a little bit because participating in something like this and really taking the opportunity to use your time, to use your academic prowess, to make a difference in the research world in not only our country, but in a global context as well, is something that's extremely, extremely commendable. And literally every single thesis that I've heard in that three minute, absolutely condensed version has been incredible. And throughout the morning, I've heard from Louis as well, that says that he cannot wait for me to join this conversation because he knows what an incredible difference this makes. And I think one of the most interesting things for, to me is the fact that we have seen three minute theses from so many different study fields. We've had music, we've had labor relations, and it's really been so incredibly interesting. And we mentioned earlier as well, I think something that we really fail to give credit to a lot of the times is the emotional strain that the research process takes on every single one of you as participants and on your families as well. Um, I th think as, as, as much as this is a lonely process sometimes, and I'm gonna draw on my own experience when I actually thought about taking a postgraduate journey, that it's, it's a very lonely process. And as much as people are there to support you, uh, your colleagues, your family, like I said, there is literally not enough time in the day. So. For those of you who are parents who have literally taken every single part of your emotional well-being and your mental health to do this, congratulations. And as someone that's not even in the academic sphere anymore, I'd like to thank you for every single thing that you do for the academic sphere 
and for research as a whole. It's time to move on to our final speaker for this morning. It's uh, Ms. Refense Petla, and she will be talking to us about soils and vegetation of naturally eroded areas in Sekukune land, South Africa. Please welcome Ms. Refense Petla. Hi, everyone. Okay. Think of a forest. It's green. Think of a forest. It's green, lush, and full of life. Beautiful to look at. Now think of the opposite. Dry heaps of soil with dry, exposed cracks in them. An absolute eyesore. They have sparse, tinno vegetation, unproductive soil, and are associated with bad management. More than 70% of South Africa's land is affected by varying degrees of soil erosion. Most of it is caused by excessive cattle grazing, logging of trees, and a population shift from rural to urban areas. Some people see these eroded areas as so-called badlands. However, this is not always the case. Some eroded areas are naturally formed in a home to numerous plants and animals. An example of such an area is Tikukuna land in South Africa. For a minute, let us imagine that these eroded areas are a shopping mall. At first glance, it is just an enormous building with plenty of parking space. But when you get inside and see all the different features that it offers, it's a completely different environment. Let us suppose that the different floor levels of the mall are comparable to the different soil types of these eroded areas. Each floor level is frequented by its own group of customers. On the first floor, people are drawn by the sight and smell of food from restaurants and food outlets just like the plants that are attracted to the dark, nutrient-rich clay topsoils. On the second floor are banks and various department stores that cater to different kinds of people with specific needs, similar to the plants that grow on the mildly nutritious, red, freely drained soils. On the third and last floor are luxury stores and high-end boutiques that cater to wealthy customers with very specific needs, similar to the specialized plants that grow on the nutrient poor, shallow rocky soils. Some plants are very exclusive, just like the, the, the wealthy customers that um, shop at high-end boutiques. In my study, I looked at the chemical and physical properties of soils from different locations to understand why they erode. Then I used these findings to connect how the different soil types influence the plants that grow in them similar to the demography of customers in a mall. But some might still ask, what is the significance of these eroded areas in South Africa? Well, they're certainly not green lush forests. However, they host endemic plants that are found here and nowhere else in the world and have important social environmental roles. They can be used to rehabilitate soils that have been contaminated by mining activities or access drought tolerant feed for livestock. Therefore, their conservation should become a priority. Thank you. Wow, what a mouthful, Refense. And uh, I love the fact that you can see how passionate you are about your research. And I have to ask you this one question because I was literally, before I had to introduce you, um, as a Afrikaans a lady that really does not try to butcher any languages, I had to say Sikukuni land 10 times before I made sure that I did not butcher the intro. Why specifically did you decide to focus on that geographical area? Okay, well, um, the study area that we were working in is, is a um, mining area. Um, it has been extensively mined. And because of this, a lot of the endemic species, which are basically species that are found there and nowhere else in the world are under threat. So we just tried to find a, a way to show how important it is to not only look at the economic development of an area, but also look at you know, conservation of the environment as a whole for sustainability um, in terms of um, the community and um, South Africa is large because um, this is an endemic area that um, should definitely be considered for conservation. Yeah. That's extremely interesting. And I have to touch a little bit on 
what you said about kind of the balance between economic development and then, of course, conservation of an area. If you have conversations with, for example, all these different role players from the economic side, as well as communities, I'm very interested to find out your opinion and your insight about how communities would generally react to, let's say, a push towards conservation of an area, because it's a very delicate balance with regards yeah. to, they might, in their minds, get more out of economic development. Yes, definitely. Well, from um, our study, we want to show that, you know, as much as it is important for economic development um, in communities to be at the forefront, we should never put um, the natural resources that we have um, in the back seat because in essence, they, um, they are beneficial for them. Like for instance, some of the plants that we find there can be used um, for livestock feed which um, we've seen when we're taking um, samples there that um, the livestock are feeding on these endemic plants, as well as, you know, because it's such a, um, an extensive mining area, a lot of the soil has been contaminated by mining activities. So um, if it's not um, conserved, it can um, lead to a lot of soil that is just land barren that will continue to be eroded and not be used um, for plants and other functions as well. And again, the passion that you have for this area is just tangible, even through a screen. So thank you so much for that. And again, also in a time where environmental protection is on everybody's minds and should be on everybody's minds. I have to yeah. ask you on a personal note, what made you choose this field of study? Well, um, I come from a mining um, hometown, Emalasheni, formerly known as Worth Bank. And just seeing the impact of mining at a large scale on the environment uh, really broke my heart because there wasn't a lot of um, emphasis on rehabilitation of these um, formerly mined areas. So I took it upon myself from a young age that I want to be um, a forerunner in um, conservation of these environments. Um, not just the destruction, you know, as much as they are good for economic growth, but we should never forget that we need our environments to sustain us as well for a lot of um, benefits that they provide to us. And that's what I want to push um, in the future in my career. The superhero lady originally from Mpubalanga. <laughs> Thank you so much for fighting the good fight, Professor. Thank you so much. To all the participants today, again, thank you so, so very much. And it really has been an honor and a pleasure for me to even join in a little part of your research. It's so incredibly interesting and well done to everybody that helped put this entire event together. Three minute thesis is not an easy thing to do. And I think the participants have done an incredible job. So from my side, thank you so much for the opportunity. And then for the final word, I'd like to hand over to someone that I ironically actually have had the privilege and the pleasure of working with in a research capacity uh, in the past. She is a force of nature and she knows it and people should tell her this 64 times a day. Uh, Professor Susan Kutsia von Roy, uh, she's a researcher in the focus area upset in the Faculty of Humanities. She studies multilingualism, and I promise you, if you get into the conversation with this woman about this, you will have the time of your life, your mind will be blown. She has extensive experience in the NRF rating process, where she worked as a member of a specialist committee, was a convener and a chair of rating panels. Dr. S uh, Professor Susan Kutsia von Roy, thank you so much, and over to you for the final word. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Sharonika. Can we all, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Fantastic. Um, it is really dangerous to speak at the end of such an event um, because obviously you are compared to all the brilliant speakers that went before you. Um, so I will be very brief and I want to make five comments from the perspectives of evaluators um, and those of us who were privileged, as you say, to be present today um, at this event. Um, first of all, 
I would like to extend uh, the congratulations from all the evaluators to all the participants. Um, participants, you did a sterling job and in the comments below that follow, you will see how we appreciate your efforts, how much we appreciate them. Um, I also want to extend a, wor a warm word of thanks to my fellow evaluators for using their time to serve here today. We appreciate your care um, in building the new generation of scholars uh, because competitions like this is a launch pad sometimes. And um, we really appreciate your expertise as well. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank uh, the complete team of Prof. Nanesi's office. Uh, Prof. Nanesi, Duret, uh, Louis, uh, Paul who did technical work, Sharonika um, and Louis who did uh, the presentation and all the other members of that team that sent emails, made sure we had the evaluation sheets. We thank you uh, for making this event possible today. Um, so now on to my brief comments. Um, first of all, we want to acknowledge that it is a major challenge to present a big idea in a very short space of time. Um, Winston Churchill was apparently, according to history books, was an outstanding speaker. And here's what he said about his preparation for speeches. Um, he said, if you want me to speak for two minutes, it will take me three weeks of preparation. If you want me to speak for an hour, I'm ready now. And that is the gist of the matter of what you all achieved today. Um, to be able to speak for a very short space of time about a complex topic um, is a real challenge. Um, and this is also acknowledged in the writing um, sphere. So Winston was a good speaker, um, but writers have also said, um, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter document. So to be brief is a really difficult um, challenge uh, to rise up to, and you did it today. So we want to start by echoing what Louis, Louis and Sharonika said the whole morning. Um, all the contestants should know that we are very aware and very respectful of the enormous challenge you accepted when you packaged your MA into a three minute presentation. Um, and please be assured of our appreciation of your mammoth achievement um, today. So that was my, my first comment. My second comment, I want to um, organize around the strengths of the presentations that we saw in the room today. Um, I first of all want to highlight the relevance of topics that I think Sharonika, you also mentioned that uh, just now when you said, wow, look at the at the topics and the themes of these MAs um, that we listened to today. And I'm a qualitative researcher, so I immediately started to code the topics. Um, and basically um, we had topics in the social domain, in the individual domain, and topics of, of great scientific relevance, all of them of great scientific relevance. So I think that is something we all note. Our MA students are asking relevant and important questions. Um, and that, that is a great assurance, I think, to people to know that our young scientists are busy with important stuff. Um, the second strength that we noted was your enthusiasm um, for your topics and for communicating about your topics. In my view, some of the best presenters could speak about their topics in a very natural way. Um, to me, it felt as if they weren't presenting. Um, they were talking to me personally, and they were telling me about their, about their work. Um, this made me feel that they know their topics really deeply, um, and they were crystal clear about the messages that they wanted to communicate. And that's why they could speak so naturally. I'm not fooled. I know that that natural presentation came after three weeks of practice. Um, but I think that's what, what we saw in the, the most outstanding presentations today, is that ability to speak naturally um, about your topic and about the details. Um, my second last comment, some areas of development. Um, it's always good, I think, to hear, okay, when I do this next, I can maybe try one or two new things. Um, 
I think this is not something that our presenters do not know, but it's something I want to emphasize at the end of the session today. Keep it simple. Um, spend even more time to decide what the core message uh, from your study is um, and what core message you want to communicate. I sometimes got a bit lost and I couldn't find that one message, that take home message um, from some of the presentations. The slide is an interesting um, communication technique um, in this competition. Um, and you can think about slides in different ways. And we've seen brilliant use of slides um, in all the ways that I sort of observed today. My advice would be keep the slide on during the presentation. Um, in such a very short presentation, the slide is a great mechanism to assist you to get your message across. So the flipping between slides and person speaking, my personal uh, preference would be to have the slide on and have the presenter, you know, present in the in the other part of the of the screen or on the other part of the screen, so that you see the presenter and the slide at the same time. Um, and then why? Because of the short space of time you have, your slide should be a mechanism. Why are we using slides? Not just because the competition says we must have one, they must have a purpose. Um, so you need to, to ask yourself carefully, why do I, what do I want to communicate with my slide? And we saw two strategies today. The one was um, people provided the structure of their presentation on some of the most successful slides. So all the structure of their thesis. This was where my problem started. This is how I investigated. And these are my main findings. I thought those slides were very, very effective. And the second approach that we saw was people who said, no, I'm going to go for something very simple. I will only have a picture, an image that I hope will evoke in my audience's mind um, the core message of what I'm, it will strengthen my verbal message with a visual aid. And that was also very effective. And we also had a slide um, that included humor um, in, in, in one of the presentations. So I think we saw good use of, of both, both um, those approaches towards slides. Um, but I, I mean, think with me about this. Very short space of time. You have one slide. How are you going to use it most effectively? I think more thought um, can go into that. Um, and then in conclusion, I want to say, um, keep on asking relevant questions. Keep on presenting your findings to broader audiences. Um, we need all of you to foster and care for our environment and our societies. And we are so thankful for your courage and your engagement. And I personally rest assured knowing that my future as an old lady, um, my future is in your capable and passionate hands. We wish you well wherever you go. We know you will make a difference. And thank you for that. Thank you so, so very much, Professor Sun. And I think there's no better way to end it with uh, those words, because that's exactly how what I felt this entire time that I've been here. And I'm so happy that that was the experience of the panel as well. To so each of the participants, again, well done. Thank you for your research. Thank you for everything that you did in preparation for this morning. And good luck.